the uh, covenant meal that's described in the scripture. Uh, it's become a good luck charm for some people. It's become a, a mystical thing. It's a simple ceremony that Jesus wanted to remind us of what he did. It doesn't turn into his flesh. It doesn't turn into his blood. It symbolizes the manna and the, the wine of his teaching that brings us life. As we've been seeing in the scripture, you're not born again by praying the sinner's prayer. It's a good place to start. But the Bible says you're born again by getting the seed of his word and planted in the soil of your heart. So it's the, the blood of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the wine symbolizing that life coming into us. The manna that God fed the descendants of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness with was literally what it is. That's what it means in Hebrew. What's it? To us, we think it means bread, but it literally means what is it? It's something God provided to nourish their bodies physically in the same way in which God provides for us life through what Jesus did. By his stripes, the Bible says we're healed. And we could spend days sharing testimonies of the things that God has done, some very extraordinary things that have happened in recent days. But the reality is, the reality is that until you make a decision in your heart to believe, you're not going to believe even if someone comes back from the dead. I'm going to read that to you in a moment. But let me start out by just throwing a couple of verses to you. If you want to head to Luke chapter 16, that's where I'm going to be in a moment. But just as a precursor to that, Mark chapter 6 says this. Jesus is talking and he's teaching in the synagogue. And it happened to be his own hometown in the book of Mark. And they looked at Jesus, heard what he was saying, said, Isn't this Mary's son? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives. And then this verse says, in one more verse, He, Jesus, could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. I believe this is exactly what Jesus would say to the American churches today. He couldn't do much in the churches in America and was astonished at our unbelief. Matthew 13, he made a similar statement. Now, I am getting over to Luke 16 in a minute, but let me just read for you. And Matthew 13, 58 says, And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Luke chapter 16, which is where I directed you. I hope that you found your way there to see this in your own Bible. Luke chapter 16 is an interesting story beginning down at verse 19 through the end of the chapter. Luke 16, 19. <clears throat> I remember the first time somebody told me the Bible says God saves our tears in a bottle. I, I went, <laughs> And then I'm reading along in my Bible one day, and guess what it says? God saves your tears in a bottle. Because it's, a, it's something that affects our heart, and it affects the condition of our heart so that the seed of the, the Word of God has the opportunity to be moistened and take root and to begin to transform us into the image of Jesus. So shut my mouth, as often happens, I was wrong. Luke 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man. He habitually dressed in purple, fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. This is Luke 16, 20 now. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores. This is a different Lazarus. So we've got two Lazaruses and a Lazaret. Cool. Thanks, Larry. I like that. Lazaret. And another Lazaret. <laughs> And he's covered with sores in verse 21, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. And besides, even dogs were coming and licking his sores. And it came about the poor man died and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his 
Finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. And then Abraham says some very profound things. Verse 25. Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' bad things. But now he's being comforted here and you're in agony. Besides all this, between us there is a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over here from there may not be able to do so and none may cross over from there to us. And he said, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. By the way, if you're wondering about the rich man being a scumbag, no, he was a nice guy. It's just his heart and his attitude were in the wrong place. Listen to what his concern was. He's in agony. He said, I have five brothers. That, they, that he may warn them lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, listen to what he says now, verse 29. Your brothers, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham concludes in verse 31 with the most profound statement. A statement which I have now, in my short life experience, come to the same conclusion. If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, in other words, the Scripture and the record of what God has done with human beings here in this world and His expressions of love all through human history. Thousands and thousands of years of history recording God's interaction with these human creatures. Abraham says, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. It's pretty profound. You turn to the left, just a few pages, one last scripture. Luke chapter 7. You know what? I sent you to the wrong one. That's another one. If we'd had more time, we'd go investigate. Actually, where I want you is Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to see if that's the right one. No, it's Matthew 11. Okay, keep going to the left. You're getting closer. If I figure out where I am, I'll let you know. <laughs> Luke, um, excuse me, Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. Let me get that right. Matthew chapter 11. Luke's got some more other interesting things along this vein. I want to conclude with this. Matthew chapter 11. Begin at verse 20. Jesus began to reproach the cities in which most of his miracles had been done because they did not repent. Now it's interesting, all of these cities were filled with people who were very religious, always observing the Sabbath, uh, celebrating the feasts and the festivals and paying tithes and, and uh, giving alms and fasting and all of these things. But it turns out they were in love with their rituals and their ceremonies and their hearts were not really turned to God, very much like most Christians in the United States of America. He began to reproach them because these cities, because they didn't repent. He says in verse 21, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which, by the way, were some of the raucous cities of the Roman Empire, and Tyre was a very prosperous city because they could, uh, they could produce this... Uh, this material, this dye that would change material to purple, which was fit only for royalty and for kings and queens, and it was very valuable, and they become very wealthy, and they were despised by the religious people as just wicked and ungodly places. We would probably compare it to San Francisco and New York City, in our thinking. Uh, those of you from Michigan, maybe you think of Detroit, or maybe you think of Chicago. But anyway, he says, if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, verse 22, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon and their raucous lifestyle in the day of judgment than it will be for you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, you self-righteous, arrogant, religious communities. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You'll descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, Jesus Christ says, Sodom would never have been destroyed. Wow, what an indictment. 
it would have remained to this day. In verse 24, Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in, for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you, you arrogant, self-righteous, religious community whose hearts are hardened toward your fellow man and hardened toward God. That's a pretty serious warning. And just in the two years that I've been here with you guys, we have seen some phenomenal things. And I can tell you, God wants us to repent, have a change of heart, cast off our religiosity, and really walk in that living relationship with God. Religion taught me to spew judgment on other people because they didn't agree with my theology or didn't practice their Christianity the way I did. That wasn't from God. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to spew judgment or condemnation on the world, but that the world, through Jesus, might be saved. That's what God wants. Our lives are all a wreck. They've been a mess. God does these extraordinary things. Odell being healed, and apparently an angel was sent and jerked on her leg in the middle of the night back in Michigan, and now she doesn't have a cane or a walker. Clarence and... Clarence is on his way back to Michigan now, heard the sound of a mighty wind, and here this 85-year-old is healed of these serious physical problems and pain in his sciatic nerve that he's had for 40 years. And then we have the testimony of these who medically were dead, and the Lord brought them back. I'm being healed of, a, of an affliction, an incurable skin disease that's been plaguing me since 1968, and it's almost completely gone now. And that doesn't even begin to touch the spiritual things God's doing with us. I've mentioned again, Rhett being restored to his sons whom he hadn't seen in 45 years. Relationships. See, folks, this is the business that God is about. And these miraculous things that we see him doing all around us. The physical ones pale in comparison to the spiritual ones, but he gives them both. They're all saying to us, repent of your ungodliness. Cast off your self-righteousness and humble yourselves. Because what does the Lord want? What does the Lord require? But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. It is life to us. It's medication to our bones and healing to our body. It is the lamp that guides the way. It is the sword of the spirit that pierces even to the separation of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And we thank you for these wonderful testimonies today. Thank you for uh, allowing Madeline to live long enough that I got to know her. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, God, for the ways you've worked in the lives of others here. Thank you that, that when that guy stepped to 357 in Kurt's mouth and he tried to pull the trigger and kill him, that you stopped it. And he sits here with us today. One thing after another, accumulating scores and scores of things to which we, some of us, are eyewitnesses. And we recognize, God, that you want us to trust in you and to walk with you. And you said the best is yet to come. Lord, today's been pretty tasty. We've savored these moments together. I thank you for that. But right now, Lord, maybe there are some that in their hearts are saying, boy, the Jesus I've known was very plastic and sterile. This is a real, active, living Jesus. And Jesus, we know that's because we found the real Jesus. Not in the image of men, but the Lord Jesus Christ standing on the pages of this book, recording the record of what He did. And Lord Jesus, today, maybe there'll be some who say, I repent of my ungodliness, and I turn away from it. And Jesus, I reach out to You, and I receive that gift of life You purchased over 2,000 years ago on this very weekend. And you conquered the grave and death so that we might have life and a relationship with living God. Thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, now, I pray that anyone that has made that commitment today would share that with others because, Lord, you said if we confess you before men, you'll confess us before the Father who's in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for all of your goodness and your wonderful provision for us. And now, Jesus, we ask you to continue to be with us as we come to observe the covenant meal. We ask you to be present and move on people's hearts now.
in Jesus' name. As the men come to prepare for the Lord's Supper, the key to that lies in 1 Corinthians, uh, a record about this. 